the Echo 360 lecture capture so you can see this again and again at your convenience. <laughs> right? <laughs> so welcome. My name is Kelly Davis. I think I've met about 90% of you in person, likely in Dover over the last few months. <laughs> I am the tattoo uh, project director uh, as of January. So this has um, been a kind of whirlwind last four and a little bit of months, um, but it's been wonderful to get things all set up and started. Um, so what we're going to start with, you see in your packet, you have an agenda. In order to provide CEUs for any offerings, you of course need to have objectives. So you'll see that those are printed on your agenda going through the day. So you'll have objectives uh, for each session. And to, at the end of the day, you have an evaluation that is also in your packet uh, that answers both to the presenter as well as the objectives listed for each. So just to start our day, disclaimer, I have no ties with anything proprietary. <laughs> there are no conflicts of interest other than TACT and ASIN and Dell Tech. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> All right. So um, what you're going to see for the overall day objectives, this really is the tech and techniques piece so that we can get everybody on the same playing field for comfort with the technology that comes with concept-based curriculum, that comes with TACT, that comes with required Echo 360 lecture capture, that is provided as extra resource with the textbooks, all of those things. So we're going to use technology and supplemental resources to enhance teaching. We're going to discuss te techniques for teaching in a concept-based curriculum because we're going to tie in all of the tech and techniques as best we can through the day. Is this the end-all be-all on any of this? Nope. <laughs> is this going to be varying levels of comfort when you're done? It is, because depending on what you've had as an intro. So those that are Echo 360 super users, can I see a show of hands? Okay. So they've already had an intro. So if, that, if they raised, your hand, if raised their hand and you have a question as we're going, it's okay to nudge, right? But we also want to reiterate that we know that that specific training that you did was um, an intro and we need more useful information. So that's what we're doing today as well, making sure that we're tying all of these ends up. Um, so to start with uh, any other kind of housekeeping things, I'm sure at this point, based on the level of hydration and nutrition that we have, right, restrooms are down the hall to the right before you get to the lobby. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for coming. I uh, thank you for traveling through uh, and such. Uh, Stanton for hosting. We had a change of venue because Terry Campus is packed to the gills today and we really did try to book there early in the semester and it wasn't going to happen for any kind of a space. Uh, and we also know that all of you get to travel next Thursday down to Owens for employee recognition. Right? So we thought fair is fair and let's come and see some stand set up as well. So here we are. So thank you for your time. Thank you for bringing the treats uh, and also for all of your effort to get to those college-wide meetings that you've been attending, whether it be curriculum or the committees or your coursework or HLH 130. There's been a variety of things that have happened in Dover over the last few months. So thank you very much for everybody's efforts. Um, and so we're going to start right in with where we are with the curriculum. So as you see on your agenda, we have 45 minutes to cover all the things of, of updates on the curriculum. I am a New Yorker, so I'll talk a little bit in New Yorker, please, but this is meant to be interactive. If you have a comment, because I just summarized from minutes for the individual courses, so if you're part of a working group that you have something else to add when I get to that course, please add. <laughs> and then you'll only hear me for about 15 minutes and then we'll hear from those that are living and breathing and recovering from Nursing 170. <laughs> right? So I just wanted to outline because I'm not sure that everybody has thought about where we're at with our groups of students because the purpose of all of this is better outcomes for our students and to be on par with where we're seeing national trends in nursing education. So this is just kind of the printed out version of where we're at with course rotation. So cohort one, why do we need to think about cohorts is first, this is our first group through. They, have you heard the term guinea pigs? We're the guinea pigs. Why do we have to be the guinea pigs? You get to be the explorers and trailblazers, <laughs> right? So we have 167 trailblazers that have um, begun our adventure with us with Nursing 170 this semester. 
And so a portion of them, and I'm, I'm not saying half because it's different on each campus, but a portion of them are going to go to the accelerated track and be in 180 and 181 this summer. In fact, two of the courses, the 181 um, mental health nursing has begun this morning at two of the campuses. So some are, are um, already in the thick of it today. And then tomorrow we start uh, here at Stanton with nursing 180. All of the courses are designed to be in seven weeks for the summer, the accelerated. That in itself was a unique challenge to get seven week sessions in the summer at Bell Tech with two in a row, things you didn't necessarily think of in preparation before, um, but have, have worked out seamlessly and students were able to, to sign up and, and all is moving along nicely. The traditional track, meaning non-accelerated, will um, be the folks that um, move into 180 and 181 this fall. And then as you can see, it just it finishes up from there. So the two kind of celebration points are certainly the 210 to 11 semester, so uh, in May and then in December of 15, we will have our first two graduates, the graduating cohorts there. So at the groups, so we'll have accelerated uh, in May of 15, and then we will have uh, the traditional track in December 15 with grads. That seems fast, doesn't it? Um, the other piece, uh, as far as the TAC perspective, is that the TAC deadline comes even faster. We are done with enrolling of new students, et cetera, in September of 15. So truly the cohort that we have that will be completed is the accelerated track that graduates in May. TAC still continues until September of 16, but in evaluation mode only, okay? So that's just where the TAC deadline comes. It's not even at the bottom of the slide, it's up one bullet point, all right, for where that, that finish line, so to speak, is. Why that matters is, um, for the setup of what TAC is. We know that TAC does supplemental resources, we know that it does uh, expenditures, we know that it does summer payroll for nursing faculty, we know that it pays for HLH lead instructors and CNA training supplies. But we also know that spending, other than TAC specific folks, needs to finish by September 15. So this is just an open, put out your thinking caps for Things that, is, things that may be on your wish list. Because over the course of the summer, the next thing for the TAC office to be doing while well, the rest of you are having some beach and or downtime, if you're not teaching 180 or 181, right, is that we're gonna look at the budget and really get down to the nitty gritty. There are some line items that we have zero flexibility without asking the feds permission for. So we're gonna be looking at where that spending is and where it needs to go by September 15th because things need to be approved, spent, et cetera, by September 15th, all right? So next year, we get to spend some money if we haven't already maxed on some of those things. So just wanted to then follow up. Cohort two are those that start this fall. Uh, we have a great group coming in. All of the admission process, the rankings were meaningful, meaning that there was um, more applicants than seats available. So to some campuses are like, yeah, of course it is. And other campuses are like, yay, we made it. <laughs> All right. So we are to the point that it is a meaningful application phase. And so that's where we're at for cohort two. Again, just looking at how that rolls out. What seems to be caught my eye as I was typing this is that now nursing 170 cohort is together. Nursing 180 run together and they don't split till 200 and 210. Right, so it's just it's already a difference in cohort two when you split it, because it's all the 170 students move to 180 because of when their start time is. Just little differences that'll make a, a change in the group, so to speak. Okay, so we've already been through most, but as you know, what has already run HLH 130 and now nursing 170 is complete. We'll hear from them, right? And you should celebrate, indeed. <laughs> and then the summer, as we talked about, 180, 181 are running and they will continue to run with the traditionals this fall. And then this fall for the first time, 200-201, the up and going. And also uh, then starting in January, final three, 210, 211, and 190, which is the transition course. <coughs> All right, so as we said, starts tomorrow for Nursing 180. So this is just a course by course. This is where you speak up if you have more to say, <laughs> okay? So Nursing 180 um, starting tomorrow and then second block for Owens and Terry. Um, each campus has chosen to adopt a module to be lead on. This is the group that, that pioneered this thought process and it really is working well. Is it 
100% effective? No, nothing is, right? But one of the things that we're doing here is increasing consistency, collaboration, and everybody's invested in doing it. One of the challenges that I saw with 170 and 170 have expressed is they had to plan it as they went. So 180 and 181 this summer say, but we don't have everything done yet. And 170 is like, are you kidding? <laughs> right? Because there's already so much already set up in each of the modules for those courses. But yes, you still feel the pain of it being the first time through. Don't get me wrong, you still do. Um, but I think time, because you're going to see this consistent, time is of the essence, and it's a precious commodity, and everybody wishes we had more. Partially why we have the time frame that we do is the fault of tact, right? It did put us on a little bit more accelerated timeline than we wished. Um, but I think we're ready, and we're rolling it, and um, we will continue to develop. So here, the next challenge that, th that we've been finding in the working process is taking the big white sheet and making it real, and making it real to 180. So that big white sheet has your concepts and your exemplars, but what if it's the same concept, different exemplar, or a, a embedded, um, one of the embedded concepts, how is that then covered in 180 that wasn't covered in 170? We want to build, not duplicate. We don't want to assume they got it. That's been the hardest challenge. And that really is increased conversation. And part of that is hearing what 170 is going to say today. And then when we follow up with another meeting in August, that's when we're going to hear more from 180 and 181 what went this summer. And it doesn't mean we're waiting to plan 200 to one until that happens, right? But we do know that we're going to have to make sure that we're not missing any pieces or not beating the dead horse with some other concepts and exemplars, right? But you should hear the conversation in 210 to 11 because what's left? There's plenty, but what's left, right? And so making sure that we're doing that building process. The other that's come up in conversation is lab sign-offs. Making sure that we have consistent expectations and consistent um, procedures. Not meaning that we're doing the same checkoffs in the same way, because it's going to be different based on lab space and based on facilities and faculty and all of those things. But making sure that we're consistent in our expectations for students is important. Uh, and then the pains of this past week with Blackboard rollout, right? Wow. Yeah, Jackie, any comments to say? <laughs> it might need to be censored. <laughs> so what that means is we've been creating uh, information in the developmental shells, and then that was needed to be populated over to the courses. We're going to make sure for the fall courses that happens earlier, um, but we wanted to get as much consistent information in the course as we could with a short turnaround time. Uh, but then there was a few blackboard glitches that were needing to be worked out and still needs a little bit more ironing. That'll be tomorrow's project as well, <laughs> right? Um, but that's been one of the, the most challenging pieces in the last two weeks is making sure that all of this good content that's been developed for them, for all the courses, all the campuses into one Nursing 180 for the first time it's rolled out in 181, first time it's rolled out is going to be, is pushed from the developmental shell to the active sections. It's the only time it will happen. From that point forward, you'll be doing course copies like you normally have. But we want to make sure there's as much consistency as possible. So we learned some lessons this week, and we'll continue to move those forward. <laughs> All right, 181. Again, their starting point took the model of each campus taking lead on one of the modules. Time. Here, resources came up as a conversation. And resources meaning that Bob, big orange book, first edition Pearson text, didn't necessarily have what uh, mental health needed. Um, so uh, they decided to use an additional text, a mental health text, uh, and so that was one topic of conversation. Blackboard rollout for them as well, for those that are starting that this summer. Um, and also the interesting conversations that revolved around where am I going for clinical? We are not um, influencing that as far as tact and as far as new curriculum. There's got to be you know, thought processes to what's available, what works for your students, all of those pieces. But what we do need to make sure is that students are getting a relatively consistent experience, meaning we can't have some groups that never see a patient in an acute care setting if other campuses do, right? So making sure that we have equity in what the students are experiencing so that they can meet clinical objectives. Right? So just making sure that that is a part of discussion. That's also come up in discussion a bunch in 211 in community. All right, Nursing 200. 
Again, they're going to start this fall. Took the model. You can see that consistent now too, because I think it's fantastic that each of the campuses is taking lead. Um, here we again come to time. We're early in the development for these guys, so there's not as many challenges. <laughs> but uh, the other piece is again, what's been covered in 180. So now we've had 170, we've had 180. What now is on the big white sheet as far as those embedded concepts, et cetera? What's there to make sure that we're getting what we need in building? All right, 201, maternal child health. Again, starts this fall, consistent with uh, each campus taking lead on modules. Biggest challenge here, again, resources. And this comes into play with the big orange book with Bob. The, uh, the part on partums, so your antipartum, I'm going to say them in the wrong order, but the partums, right? So your partums, can you tell I'm on the PED side, not the OB side, right? But the partums had a paragraph that was this long in Bob. That's not sufficient, but there was an electronic resource we weren't aware of that they added electronic chapter, chapter 23 for Bob because it was just missing, right? So that piece, we've, um, we're facilitating for students on how to get access to the electronic resources, but also what are we doing for supplementing the Bob for, for the rest of the students. We'll talk more about that later on this afternoon. The other uh, interesting dilemma that came is a little bit of, shall we say, turf war, right? So we were taking a pediatric course and an OB course and pushing them together, which means that you're sharing time um, sometimes tug of warring for those sorts of things. So just making the conversation of as far as what gets covered in what amount of time, where the clinical site, uh, clinical hours going to be, things like that, um, was an interesting challenge and unique to them because no, no other course is combining two. It's combining content from different med surges, but it's not combining two courses. All right, 210, 211, 190. All of these start in 15. There are varying levels of completion, but just wanted to show that all of them are meeting and starting in discussion. Some um, courses are having more discussion uh, than others at this point, but everybody's ramping up and will be meeting before the end of this, um, before you're off on uh, for the 10 month contract. All right, so what do I feel is really important to make sure that is consistent between the courses? Certainly communication paths, and this comes out of our lessons learned, making sure that the med surges know what's being built on versus duplicated. Our syllabi, college-wide curriculum members, if you say to them, CCPOs, MPOs, you might see tears, <laughs> right? We are revising those syllabi to make sure that the CCPOs and MPOs are addressing the PGCs, and I know I just spoke in initials, I'm sorry, <laughs> but we're making sure that we speak to the program graduate competencies. What we don't want to lose is all the work that was put into your original syllabi that, it, that tied to the concepts, because those are good objectives, and those, that work is good work. We just need to move it to the lesson plans, not to the syllabi, right? So that's where the switch is happening. Uh, we're also going to be working by the end of, um, I keep saying 10 month contract, by June 10th, we're also going to be working on making sure that the course descriptions are a little bit more student friendly, and a little bit more concise. So that is also something that we hope to have up and running and ready for submission for the summer. Grading, we all know that there's the percentages, but we want to make sure that grading remains consistent. Um, surveys, outcomes committee, we'll talk a little bit more about what they've been doing later as well, but the outcomes committee has created the clinical survey and the, uh, that tied in with that is the clinical experience, the clinical site, and the clinical instructor. And it's electronic, which much to our surprise, <laughs> we got that rolled out for 170. The other piece is the HESL combination with outcome survey. HESL is our third party evaluator. That is the course and beginning a program for TAC and the uh, instructor survey for 170. So that also is done electronically and will roll out. Blackboard structure. We would like the tabs on the left hand side to maintain its consistency. They do not need to be exact, but on each campus we want to make sure that the course is using the same tabs, right, for the most part. And also that course to course, a student going from 170 to 180, 181 to the 200, 201 should see the same setup as far as the tabs so that they know where to find things. They shouldn't have to look for the syllabus in different areas. They shouldn't have to look for their course calendar in different areas. We just want to make sure that it's user-friendly for them. 
So that's what I mean by blackboard structure. The tabs on the left, right? Not that they have to be cookie cutters, but that's why we're creating that consistency to push out. We've already talked about lab skill expectations and checkoffs. Um, we, of course, want to maintain the same quality on each campus. So that means the same level of continued effort for developing materials and for posting materials and for sharing materials, okay? Because here's the bottom line, right? No surprise. We need to meet async criteria. We need to maintain or improve NCLEX pass rates, and we need to align for Dell Tech expectations. How about three masters? Doesn't even say tapped in there, right? <laughs> so it really is a challenge to bring all of those pieces together, but that bottom line all turns out to student outcomes, right? All right, so you know that there are four college-wide committees, and so curriculum, testing, outcome, and student. So those four committees, just showing you that, that where they are as far as their meeting process. And when we're done with this topic, I also just want to show you Blackboard and where to find all of the materials and resources and such that they've been developing so that everybody can see where they're at. Because this is, is, and it's going to continue to be a transparent process. So there's not anything that's happening behind closed doors. Anybody is welcome to attend any of these meetings, <laughs> all right? So we can continue to have those open discussions. But I want to leave a big chunk of time for the lessons that we've learned from 170. So we have three main spokes, folks, spokesperson, spokesperson, I like spokes, folks. All right, so we have three main presenters that are going to just talk about what they've experienced and then open it up to some questions. So here we have Anne Marie, and you can go in any particular order. You might all three want to come forward, and then we'll go from there. So Anne Marie from Stanton Campus, Peggy Betch from Terry Campus, and Susan Tyndall from Owens Campus. And you can come and share your, your experiences thus far. So you go. You're, you're our guest. We should go last. <laughs> That's a cop out. Wait, where's Terry Campus? And they're closer to you. I'm Sue Tindall from Owens Campus, and we had four people on our 170 team. And that's, and I'm going to say them all. There's one here. There's four. <laughs> that was, anyway, we all survived. We had a lot of help from a lot of people. We had our lab person help us tremendously. Um, I was just going to talk about some statistics of our course because in talking with the other campuses, we realized that a lot of things were very similar. Not that we thought, and we were kind of surprised that it all happened that way. Um, we started at Owings campus with 33 students. We had the fewest students of all three. Um, and where we um, didn't retain our students, we lost two students um, to not performing their skills adequately. So we lost one um, in blood pressure sign-off and one in med lab sign-off. Uh, we lost one student who had life experiences not conducive to staying in school. We had one student who had to withdraw medically because of um, an injury. And then we had three students in the end who received um, failing grades. And I just thought of it earlier. I didn't, I didn't write down what those failing grades were. Do you remember, Kathy? I know the last one he just failed had a 74.2. Yeah. Around 72. Around 72, that's what I thought. Um, so it makes our retention rate at a 79%, or if you look at the other way, the attrition rate is about a 21%, which for our campus is better than we had traditionally had. Um, we didn't have any students get an A. We had 13 get a B and 13 get a C, which is never usually that high in the Bs for us. And then we had the three students fail and the four withdraw. Um, we had talked about in our college-wide meeting talking about the um, how our students did with that ACI. <coughs> I don't know what was it the, the last one they did that ACI proctor test, I guess. So for our students um, doing that ACI proctor test, 10% uh, scored a level three, so they received the most points on their team final, and then we had 19%. 
66% get a level proficiency level two, and then 21% a proficiency level one, and 3%, one student yet below a proficiency level one. So with that, the level ones and belows, all students did the remediation to get the 75% and yeah. earn the points for their team final. So um, we thought that it was a good benefit to the students that even though, I know because there was a lot of talk about are those points for the final giving them, uh, we didn't feel that it was giving them the points because there were things on that ACI that they hadn't seen before that we didn't cover in class. So truly, if they got those scores on it, they were hopefully learning something from it and gaining, gaining knowledge, whether it was reinforcing what we taught them or things that they had learned through doing their practices. So that's kind of how our statistics broke down. Um, as far as getting through the semester, I know the <clears throat> week that our class ended, I don't know about the rest of my group, but I was at my office like, okay, what, what should I be doing now? Because I'm not really sure because we've been so focused on getting all of our modules and getting our lectures and getting our learning activities up and prepared. It was like, what? So I've been helping the 181 people and the 180 people um, and just um, I found that the better we work together, we have a very well-functioning group, I think, um, the easier it was. Bounced a lot of ideas off a lot of people. You know, this is what we're looking at. The active learning strategies are certainly, you know, some of them we had already been doing. So we figured out where they fit and we, we continued them. Um, we created a lot of new active learning strategies. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say because somebody's like, well, which ones worked and which ones didn't? I'm like, I'm not really sure that I, that I know that because how, does, how do you say it worked? You know, did it work and show in test results? I'm not sure that it was the active learning strategies or that the students prepared or in engaging the students, which sometimes was very difficult. And I think we would all agree that in the beginning of the semester, the students were coming better prepared for class than as we got towards the end of the semester. So that's definitely something you have to continue to put out there and work on um, to hold the students accountable for coming prepared. I think ours started getting a little lax. Ours were getting a little snarky by the end of the semester. And that's all I got our people. Okay. Well, that guessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm well, I'm from Cary Campus, and uh, we started with 51 students. We lost one student who withdrew because she wasn't sure that this is what she wanted to do, but has decided to come back and join us next uh, in the fall. We had one student that uh, remediated in clinical, went to the lab and failed blood pressure sign off one that failed clinical, and then one student that failed theory. So we felt that our retention rate was pretty good for the first time through. As far as ACI goes, <coughs> out of the 51 students, we had, uh, well, yeah, 51 students. We had three that scored, or um, four that scored a level three. Uh, we had 34 that got a level two, and eight that got a level one, and two that got below level one. And of those that got one or below, all but two students decided to do the remediation. I will say for one of our students that did the remediation, it did make the difference for him in passing the course. Uh, active learning strategies, I think we implemented a lot of new ones. We used some old ones that we've had. Again, I'm like you, I don't know if, if if it made them learn or if they learned because they were preparing and studying more, we did find that as the semester progressed, especially when our students started clinical, uh, they seemed to become less prepared for class. So, um, we're hoping, I think there's, I think there's 20 some of them going on, that's correct, so they're going on to the accelerated 18th. That are going to accelerate it, and the rest are going to remain uh, as traditional students. Uh, some of them evening, weekend, some of them days for us. So, but it was it was a challenge at times. We had uh, six instructors on our team. Two of them uh, were brand new to us, and um, so they had a lot of good, fresh ideas and input. 
Uh, so we're hoping fall is going to be even more exciting. Well, I'm Ann Murray from Canton campus. There were seven of us who taught this course. We had 90 students. That's 9 0. <laughs> that we took in. Our faculty, we were fortunate, I think, because all of our faculty were experienced uh, fundamental instructors and had worked with the beginning level student, and I think that was just a huge plus. Um, statistics first from our 90 students, we had three withdraw, and two, two of those students were failing at the time of their withdrawal. We had two academic and clinical failures and one academic failure. So we're passing on 84 students out of 90. Um, as far as ATI, this was our first time to use ATI. And we had uh, 22 students at level one, uh, 15 of those remediated um, for those points. We had 58 at level two and we had six at level three. Um, just to share with you a little bit of our learning from this semester, um, we talked about it a bit and we uh, felt that we really liked the <coughs> conceptual learning model and the concept-based learning. And we liked the student engagement that went along with that. Um, we liked guiding the students through activities and helping them to be creative and learn from each other rather than the traditional uh, model of uh, um, you know, passive, you know, passive learning uh, with the students engaged less. Um, uh, we decreased lecture quite a bit, and, but we didn't eliminate it entirely. So we had a little bit of lecture and a lot of learning activities. Some of our learning activities we had used before in some of our seminar formats, so we were able to incorporate some of those, and then we had to develop a lot of new learning activities like we all did, uh, and trying to use technology with our um, um, active learning strategies, whether it was clickers or um, DT Phone Home. What's that one that we used, Kim? <laughs> Poll Anywhere, thank you. Uh, we used that. Um, we liked posting the short lecturette um, for most of our classes. Um, we did the ticket to class and pre-assignments. Um, we found that most of the students did do those tickets to class. Uh, we used ATI for some of their tickets to class. Um, and that um, <coughs> we did find that most of the students uh, actually came to class and that the attendance held pretty good. We kind of wondered about that, um, trying to find that balance between not giving them too big of a pre-assignment uh, so that they just you know, weren't going to do it. And then if they didn't do it, they just weren't going to come. So we didn't, we didn't find that. We found the attendance held pretty well and that they did uh, do their pre-assignments and their tickets to class. Um, we liked the conceptual framework for teaching in the uh, clinical setting. Um, we found that the concepts um, helped us to help students to apply what they had learned and uh, that we could use that well in the clinical setting to help them, uh, to assist them to uh, identify problems and use the nursing process and that we could do some creative clinical teaching, which we've been encouraged to do kind of consistently. Um, and we like the clinical evaluation tool, which was new for us. Um, we like the weekly feedback. Um, and um, we thought, I think, overall, um, that, um, you know, there might be some little rearranging that we might want to do, uh, but uh, we'll have to talk about that as a group. Uh, we didn't get into a lot of specifics, um, but um, overall we sort of feel like Sue and Peggy, we survived. And um, I personally learned that it's okay at work every few days to completely fall apart and break down and cry. <laughs> there were lots of people there to patch me back together. So then again, once it was over, again, I felt, oh, I got nothing to talk about today, so I can keep going. Um, help somebody else who looks like they're getting ready to crash. But it was a little stressful. But we little, we're all here on the other see, side. See, we're all here. We made it to the we're flip side. The uh, side. And um,
and we, we did feel that there was a bit of the, uh, oh, you know, we're guinea pigs and what are we all doing? And, you know, but I think that that, you know, is sort of to be expected. And I, I think Anytime. For, for part of it, I think fundamental courses are, to some, ex, to some extent, were set up kind of concept-based anyway. Yeah. Because we were, in our course before, I know from Owen, we were teaching infection, we were teaching safety. So a lot of our fundamental setup prior to this was somewhat concept-based which might roll out differently into the other courses, the other med surge courses, which I know, at least at Ellen, I can't speak for the other campuses, till now weren't necessarily a concept base. So, you know, some of the things were very, very similar, aside from, you know, rearranging things because we were focusing on different exemplars than we may have in the past when we were doing our, our content. Um, I think a lot of fundamental courses are set up kind of well, um, uh, for a lot of our week, you know, keeping the skill with the concept and trying to implement as we were directed and as we learned, we would do the concept and then the skill and in the lab, and then the next day we might go into the hospital for one day. For one day, that's just how it worked best for us in those early weeks. And so, um, taking the students in one day, the we we had our um, faculty who might have taught that concept. Let's say it was oxygenation, and so that faculty member who who was kind of in charge of that concept in that lab. Um, helped us by developing some clinical activities that would focus on oxygenation. So uh, we might be able to go in and do some um, assessments and some activities related to that one concept for that one day. Uh, and since we are so, you know, so con we have been so consistently encouraged to do that at every, you know, conference that we've been to that we, for the past couple of years, you know, to change, you know, change up your teaching a little bit and try to do some different things in the clinical area. So that, that's what I meant by that. Um. And we, we tried that and we, the four of us just talked about that, I don't know, last week or something, and realized that we didn't think that we did that well enough or that was our intention. Um, but it's, it's more difficult than you think going. So I think having those prepared um, activities based on the concepts is, I think, a great idea of what kind of what we were talking about last week that we needed to sit down. I think for the four of us, we kind of threw all of our efforts into getting the, you know, the theory portion of the learning activities and we kind of had clinical out there as, oh yeah, we'll do it concept based and we've done clinical and I think we kind of rolled into there without enough of a cohesive layout of what we could do as clinical activities based on the concepts. So, so we're going to focus a little bit more for next semester on pulling our clinical piece together a little bit better at the concept base because we did realize that while we thought we were trying it, it didn't necessarily, the students didn't pick it up that they were focusing on the concept that they just learned in class like we thought it would have been so easy to get them to realize. Like guys, we just spent you know, however many, four or five weeks doing each piece of your physical assessment and now you're going to stand in lab and tell me you have no idea how to do all those pieces together. So those kind of things, we're like, but we've just done it for five weeks. And I can say for us, I think we went to clinical later than um, yeah, we the other early. two campuses with the hope that the students would take what they had learned and be able to pull that together and look at the total patient <coughs> and take care of the total patient. And, and emphasize on things that they had learned and then use things that maybe they hadn't learned as a learning tool in clinical. Uh, thank you. Um, and I was curious about the length of time that you attached to the pre-assignment mm -hmm. thinking that it was too long, even if it's not from the class. So did you come up with an average time that a student, like your pre-assignment, how much time did you, what's a good time I don't know that we did that, uh, that we said that there would be an average time. Uh, I, I guess I know that my pre-assignments that I gave them 
shouldn't shouldn't have taken them the specific no let me let me rephrase the ticket to class part you know that might have been something that they could have done in a half an hour or 40 minutes i don't know about everyone else but but if you rolled in the reading and the watching of the lecturette or if there was some other activity you know that went that went with the whole pre-assignment what do you all think? An hour, an hour and a half? I don't know. I guess the readings would be different if for also. Um, so I'm not sure um, about how long. But, but we, we tried um, for the tickets to class, I guess, you know, especially not to make it onerous for them. Um, you know, so they wouldn't just go, oh my gosh, you know. Just in fact, this is the first time that you all are doing this course, so not to expect so much of yourself as you, you know, learn how a layer may be in. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, they all got something from clinical. Exactly. We're out there doing now. Do we think, looking back, that we tied it in the best to concept basis? And I don't think we did. But I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today. Yes. But um, I was just curious, I know we'll have evaluations, but I was curious, as zoning, what kind of feedback did you hear from students along the way? I'm sure there was some pushback. There was some pushback. Um, they, as, as we all identified, they um, quickly got on the, um, we're the guinea pig wagon and they stayed on it um, pretty pretty strong. Um, and um, they used it anytime they could. And, and yeah, frequently. And we've heard that in various you know, And they associated that, that with the beginning of how it is. with them being in a deficient place. That that their place was not good because they were the you know um, <laughs> so there was that. And uh, then uh, we found um, uh, I guess it was about midway through whenever we did our uh, SIC, our student issues, you know, feedback from the students, that they, uh, our, our students, wanted to have more lecture. So they wanted the faculty to lecture more and to uh, kind of provide them, our students felt, to provide them with more um, out longer outlines and more material and couldn't we just do more in general uh, for until them. Of course, until of course you ask those same questions to a student who's been in a regular lecture heavy content then they don't want all that lecture. So, so uh, one of the things that we did learn because I didn't want to be up here forever but um, we did learn that um, we need to do we need to make uh, clearer the connections for them in class between the activities that we're doing and how that's, you know, helping them to learn the concept. So um, just to do a little bit better job of that, of kind of, you know, this is what we're doing today and th these activities well, are, exactly, and so that they can, you know, so we'll, we're going to work on that a little bit more. Um, Kind of in the same thing where we were thinking in clinical, if I was telling, if we were doing oxygenation in theory and I was telling everybody in clinical to go listen to lung sounds, it was perfect sense in my mind that we were talking about right. things related to oxygenation. Same with the learning activities. If we were doing, you know, some theory and your prep work was on oxygenation and then we were doing some type of activity in class that had to do with that, we just assumed that it would be because, you know, that's what they were learning. Yeah, they didn't make all the all the connections, and I think maybe it's a begin. Some of it is a beginning student function, and um, you know, so. Um, we did change ours. Kind of yes. Oh, what kind of clinical paperwork and homework did we have for the students in clinical? We kind of did the same thing. We, the students were responsible for an assessment. We have an assessment tool that's kind of like a check checkbox thing. 
we had in the semester prior um, used STEM chart for the students to document. Um, so we didn't have that. So we had a, you know, kind of a paper head to toe assessment form. They had to do that. Um, we did either and both care plans and concept maps. We did in post conference. Um, you know, they were responsible for the meds they were giving and knowing about their patients and the nursing home. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, I think that was basically it. So ours didn't really have a lot of homework that they were responsible for in the evenings of clinical, probably other than looking up the meds because they didn't get those until, you know, that day we were in clinical. So half of them, at least my students, half of them were giving meds the same day they got the meds, so they got opportunity to kind of look them up quickly. The other half were giving meds the next day, so they had that overnight, and then we tried to switch them up, so some, you know, you weren't always the person kind of giving them a little less prepared, but they didn't have a lot of homework assignments. And our students uh, did have uh, a database that they had to fill out with an assessment <coughs> They had to bring the lab values that they had gathered from the patient's chart, the medicines that they had to uh, look up. Um, they had to formulate uh, a problem list and pick up the top two problems, maybe uh, formulate nursing diagnosis, come up with interventions that they could implement on day two. And then, so the only thing they could have been doing day two was documenting whether their interventions worked, if they didn't, and why. And then they had to talk about the two nursing diagnoses and how they interrelated to each other. So I think our paperwork was probably a, more, a little more intense than maybe the other two campuses. Uh, they, they were expected to do it uh, after day one at home. Um, that didn't always work though. Yeah, we did revise our uh, clinical assignments a bit. Um, of course, the assessment was there. There was a little space for documentation of a nursing note. Uh, if they didn't do it at their facility in the computerized record, it, it differed a little bit depending upon where, where they were. At my facility, you know, after a little while, they put their note in. I had the capability to edit it, so it, they did it there, and they, you know, didn't have to, you know, in real time, and didn't have to, um, um, do it on the pa on the pa on the paper, but if if so, they could have done that. Um, um, we did uh, also try to decrease um, a lot of the clinical paperwork, thinking that we were adding this work for class. Um, and they did um, their nursing process every week and identified a nursing diagnosis and interventions, which we tried to have them do in the clinical setting. Um, so that they didn't have a lot to do, and of course they did the sort of the standard uh, work on their <laughs> drugs and looking up, looking up their drugs. And there was a med pass uh, sheet that we developed. So we did uh, think about the um, clinical homework, and you know that that would be decreased somewhat, and that we would work on. Um, getting them to do work in, you know, the real time in the clinical setting as much as possible. And of course, they get better and better at that. In the beginning, you know, they didn't have a lot. At, at Owens, we had kind of got, we had gotten away from a lot of clinical homework because prior to starting 170 at Owens campus, we were front loading all of our theory and then going to clinical all at the end. So. The semester before we did 170, we were going to clinical four days in a row. So there wasn't a lot of turnaround time for them to do it and us to look at it to give back. So we had not, we had kind of tightened it up and gotten rid of a lot of the length of doing something that they couldn't do real time in clinical to get done um, just because we were in clinical for four days in a row. Yeah, they did, they did, and actually, I probably heard more from upper-level students between 
API and what the books did than whether whether the 170 students were going to somebody else. I didn't hear as much difference in our students, for Kathy shaking her head, they did, as I have in our students finishing our old program between API and what they got in their books or class and other faculty. So we did hear feedback about the inconsistency. So we do have some things, I guess I hadn't thought about it as a list, but we do have we do have some things. Um, that were different between, say, the, the skills book and um, ATI. So we can pass that on. Um, we resolved it the, the best way we could. When, when questions came up, we said, okay, go by, you know, if it was an ATI video, perhaps, that we used. And, this, you know, we said, okay, let, you know, we'll go by this, you know, for this, for this skill. And then after we uh, got a little bit farther along, a few weeks in, then we realized, and we ha we realized we had to do some preemptive. And so then we just put it out there in front. We said, okay, we, we realize there are these differences, you know, between, and then we, we sort of, it was the first time uh, uh, for us to use ATI. So we sort of had to get in the groove of, you know, and of course the first time for us to use uh, Pearson. Um, you know, we always had, Taylor and everything was all lined up and everything was the same and the videos were the same and these were the days. But anyway, um, <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> Sue, did you want something? We have to find that the fundamental class no, thank you. Very, we've always had comments about, you know, mostly in lab about the instructors being consistent and you told me this, you told me this. They're such concrete thinkers, it's very difficult when a slight, we all know there are a lot of ways to do everything we do, and they're all good ways, and not all of them, but most, <laughs> a lot of them are good ways, and they're valid, and you can, you know, not break sterile technique, and do things a lot of different ways. But in this very first course, they so struggle with black and white, and, you know, we try to convince them the best we can that there's a whole lot of gray, but, we do have to evaluate everybody on some given set. So, you know, I think that's kind of, I know we've always had that as a struggle in our fundamentals. Um, I don't know about the other campuses. The one other thing I wanted to say real quick is we all found it very interesting that um, out of all of our tests, I think every campus had the lowest scores and by a tremendous margin on the same test, module two. So while like I said, what, is, what can we do to this module two that kind of the heavier part of the assessment load. Um, but I thought that that was interesting considering each campus designed, I mean, we had the, con the concepts and exemplars for the module, but basically each campus designed how they were going to present that and design the test questions independently and all had very similar results on that test. So, for, oh. Yeah, we had a comment. Yeah. Indeed. So that was next. Yes, please. <laughs> Karen beat me to the punch. Thank you. No, that's exactly it. Thank you to all of the 170 instructors and to the three that were willing to stand up in front of the crowd. <laughs> right. That was a very useful information. I want to let you know two other follow-up things that's happening with 170. 170, all the faculty are meeting on Employee Recognition Day. They're taking their afternoon to meet. So there will be more discussions within 170 about the consistencies, um, about what needs to change, lessons learned there. The other piece is that Outcomes and Curriculum have created a survey, um, and using the word survey, not evaluation, because that's just our evaluation tool for students, everything else is a survey, but a survey for all of the 170 instructors to complete, to think about were the concepts good, were the, uh, as far as the order, the, the number, all of those pieces. So that survey was created that each instructor that teaches a course will complete that so that we can get feedback from them to, for their working groups, but also so that we can use that information at college-wide curriculum to see what still needs to be tweaked, all right? So I read it in the CCIT blog last week that you should attend one active learning strategy is to just end with a slide that says, in conclusion, and let them conclude and ask their questions. But we've done that and we're out of time.
So in conclusion, <laughs> you get no more active learning at the moment. <laughs> but we are going to have the follow-up session. So do know that we will have more conversation and more time for con conversation at the next gathering that we have. Most of you should already have this on your calendars, but this is confirmed that we have Monday, August 18th, 9 to 4 at Terry campus, and we will be doing similar uh, information sessions in the morning and then course and committee working groups in the afternoon. So we'll be regrouping and hearing the lessons taught and learned from 180 and 181 in August. All right. So now it's a 10-minute break while we set up so for the next. So take 10 minutes, and we'll go from there.